Lord God Almighty, Father, indeed, you are the creator, maker, sustainer of both heaven and earth. And we thank you, Father, for your care for us with your everlasting love, which never runs out and never runs dry. Thank you that the sting of death has been broken forever. And the curse of the grave has been destroyed through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you because he, indeed he has broken forever the power of death and hell for all who trust in his name. Lord, I thank you, Lord, for this church, Bay Area Agape Fellowship. I thank you, Father, for even a, a few minutes ago to hear from Joy and her testimony about your amazing grace and your guidance in her life. I thank you, Lord, how you have saved people here how you are sanctifying them in your word and through the fellowship here, and how you have set them apart to do your work, to do your will, and to bring worship before you. And so I ask that you would bless their witness, that you would strengthen their, their faith and their fellowship. And bless us even now as we take time uh, to be in your word. We pray that you would help us not only to receive your word, uh, but also to apply your word. And so, Father, we pray all these things and, and trust these, this church and trust ourselves to you. May you be exalted and we all be humble. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to ask you, um, is the world getting better? Now, we have to be careful because maybe the, sometimes our stage of life could also determine our, our answers. Maybe the younger we are, we're, we're, we're looking forward to, to, to this world. We're looking forward and, and see everything rosy. And we're very optimistic. But some of us who have been around for a while, maybe we've seen some things and uh, maybe it hasn't always been positive. Maybe it has been negative. Um, maybe we, we haven't always experienced all that we want to experience and we've experienced disappointment. And sometimes we're, the older we get, we get a little bit more discouraged or more doubtful. And sometimes we long for maybe yesterday. But we have to realize, especially when it comes to the Christian life, that in this world, we can expect tribulations. We could expect trials. It's not if, it's, it's a win. And we are going to counter conflict. We, we are going to counter chaos. We're going to go through our share of confusions from time to time. And sometimes it comes like, a, like waves in the ocean just hitting us time and time again. And so sometimes we have to realize and, and wonder, well, how can we remain faithful? How, how can we remain constant in the truth of Christ? How can we even progress to get stronger when it seems like more and more it's getting tougher and tougher just to be a believer? just to be faithful to our Lord and our God. This morning, I want to point you to, to one verse. One primary verse that we'll talk about today, but I'll have some supporting verses, but one verse. And if you have your Bibles, please turn to Hebrews chapter 13, verse, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. It's a very simple yet profound, yet concise verse. And it reads, the word of the Lord reads, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. We could easily remember this, right? Yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the same. 
This truth should, should in some sense anchor us. It should give us confidence in the midst of conflict. Whatever we face, wherever we stand, wherever we are, this in some sense gives us the assurance. It helps us to face the, the, the future. It should help us at the beginning of the day. It should help us at the closing of the day. We could thank our Lord Jesus. So here in the book of Hebrews, and let me just give you a little background before we get into it. The, the book of Hebrews, unlike the other, epist other epistles, it doesn't start off like a letter. Uh, in fact, it, do it doesn't have a salutation, that is, greetings. It doesn't identify a particular church. However, there are a few scattered references in terms of to the brothers or to the beloved or the dearly loved, indicating that they were of the same faith, that they have the common bond in, in Christ. We could understand in, 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 as reading the entire book that these are not newly converted in, in their faith. In fact, they may have been some of the earliest followers. The, the earliest manuscript that has this, this book says to the Hebrews, in other words, it was a certain Jewish background uh, community who had placed their faith in Christ. And this is the target. This is who it was written towards. And now for the sake of brevity here, we could say that these believers may have been shaken. Uh, they may have been rattled in, in, a, in a certain way in terms of that have led to their discouragement or have led to their doubts. And thus, when you open up the book of Hebrews, you see the supremacy or the glory of Christ. It comes and jumps right out. Jesus is better. Christ is exalted. Yesterday, today, and forever. Now we get to chapter 13. And when we look at chapter 13, it's, it's almost like the downward descent of the, uh, of the book. And, and it's the closing. And, and you have a lot of last minute exhortations or encouragements that are coming and it just comes in rapid fire. And then you have this, what I would call the standalone verse here in, in verse eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. When you pair this verse down, you discover that this verse in some sense echoes um, the book of Hebrews. It also makes an impact on both understanding the verses ahead as also the verses following. Now, for the sake of this message, I want to be really simple because I'm simple. I'm going to give you three points. If you have notes you can, or have a pencil or pen, you could, you could jot it down. If you don't, you could easily remember it because I'll tell you exactly where I'm going. I'm going to talk about Jesus yesterday. I'm also going to talk about Jesus today. And I'll also talk about Jesus forever. Those are our markers. Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. By the way, these markers have all, all have been previously employed in, the, in, the, um, in chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, in verse 26, uh, the, the second part of verse 26b, it, it tells us Jesus appeared once and for all. The culmination of the age is to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. He appeared once and for all. The culmination of all ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice himself. That is yesterday. Also in chapter 9, in verse 24, it's a quick verse that says, Jesus entered heaven itself now to appear for us in the presence of God. 
So you key on the word now. This is what Jesus is doing today. And then if you go to verse 28b, Jesus will come again to bring everything into completion, especially not to bear sin, but to bring or to save those who are waiting for him. That is what's lying in the future. That is what's lying later. So Jesus, yesterday, today and forever, that's where I'm going today. This is where the verse is right now. Jesus, yesterday. Now, when you look at the book of Hebrews and you, you walk through it, the book of Hebrews features the, the nature of the Son of God. In other words, it tells in terms of his, his divineness. It tells in terms of his, uh, also in terms of his humanness in chapter one. In chapter five, <clears throat> excuse me, particularly in uh, verse, um, chapter five, verse seven, <clears throat> it talks about Jesus and it says, and it uses the phrase, <clears throat> In the days of, of his flesh, in the days of his flesh, this is who he is, and this is what he did. He prayed here on earth, in the flesh. He offered up, and he, it says that, that he prayed with loud cries and tears to him, that is God, who was able to save him from death, and when he heard because of his reverence. In the days of his flesh, what was he doing? Yesterday, what was he doing? He was praying. Now, not just in this book of Hebrews, we have, a, we have other written accounts of Jesus who was yesterday in the days of the flesh. The four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John tells us gives us a recorded account of who he is. And it highlights, each one of them highlights uh, different aspects of, of Jesus. Matthew takes a look at the, him being fulfilled as the Messiah, fulfilling all the Old Testament hopes, and of course, setting up his, um, proclaiming his, the kingdom of God. The book of Mark talks about him being the suffering servant. The book of Luke, the savior for all, for all people, he's bringing salvation to everyone. The invitation is open. And then, of course, John talks about this, him being the, the son of God. Remember, Jesus said to Philip, you see me, you've you, you seen, the, seen the father. The self-revelation of God through Jesus Christ. And it's all here. If you think about it, if you read through the gospel account, you, you realize how he approached the unapproachable. How Jesus approached the unapproachable. How he knew people's past, and he continues to draw near to them. Remember Philip, he knew of his past, he drew near to him. The woman at the well, among others, how, remember how he remembered Zacchaeus. He would say, hurry up and come on down. And it's necessary for me to, to eat and dine at your house today. We remember in terms of how Jesus taught. He taught with joy. He taught profoundly. He asked people to remember the, the kingdom of God in parables. We notice when he looked out into the crowd, he cared with compassion. He wanted to be understood by all. He would identify himself. He would say, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. We remember his miracles, the calming of the stormy seas, the, the water to, to wine, the, the raising up of Lazarus from the dead, among others. And so when we think about all the things that was written about Jesus in the gospel account, we don't have to use that expression 
I wish I could be a fly on the wall, right? Sometimes we say, I wish I could be a fly on the wall that I could hear that conversation or I could be there right there. Well, scripture has it. Scripture has it and we're, we're right there. We hear the words of the, of the Lord. It's described the scene of the miracles that he did. We have a good picture of what Jesus was or is yesterday. His purpose was unmistakable. We remember Jesus who said, I, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Earlier, I referenced uh, Zacchaeus and remember the snicker, snickering of the religious leaders. I said, oh, he's eating with sinners. But remember, Jesus wanted to be there. And remember the statement that he, he mentioned in Luke tells us why. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Jesus came for sinners. He came for sinners like us. Those who are lost, those who are in the dark, those who are guilty before God. And he came with compassion. He came with purpose. And he came with power. Jesus even described how his heart is in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. And he uses these terms. And he says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. And those who come to me will find rest in their souls. How he describes himself, his heart, he uses the word gentle and lowly. And he gives the invitation to, to come to him that you would find rest in him in this chaotic world. That you could find rest and peace in him. About Jesus yesterday, we could trust in him. And if you have not, you can look for Jesus for yourself and take a look at what the Bible tells of him. You could trust him. You could trust him today. Jesus yesterday. Jesus today. Speaking of today's or days, if you ever think about it, during the week, some of us change during the week. I change during the week, by the way. Um, Sunday, of course, is always a peak day for me. And then, of course, uh, Monday, I've kind of relaxed a little bit more. And then Tuesday, I kind of gear up. We change from day to day as far as maybe our demeanor. Maybe we have something coming up. Uh, maybe celebration or something, and we look forward to those certain days. But we change. Our moods change from day to day. But when it comes to Jesus, he is the same. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, two things I want to kind of mention about today. That he, Jesus prays and he saves. I want to reference in terms of a passage in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. It says, consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make an intercession for them. Jesus saves and Jesus prays. He saves and prays today. He's able to save us completely. And the premise is, is that we know that Jesus saves. He saves us from the penalty of sin. He saves us from the power of sin. And one day, of course, he will save us from the very presence of sin. And of course, he died on the cross for our sins. He saves us completely. 
And according to this verse, he lives to today to intercede or pray on our behalf. So when we read the Gospels, and we look through the Gospels account, we read and we see Jesus yesterday reaching the lives of people. The woman at the well, Zacchaeus, Peter, and transforming them, reaching into their lives, teaching into their lives, transforming their lives. And so we think about even today. We, we, we not only look back to yesterday, but we discover today's the same He's the same today. That same transforming power that transformed Peter's life or the woman at the well is the same transforming power that's happening today in our lives. For those who come to him, like entering the narrow gate, like believing him as the bread of life, like trusting him as he who satisfies the thirst in our soul, like calling upon him to be saved, will be saved. Romans 10.9 says, if we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's Jesus today. And notice the, the, the term since, the substantial clause, he always lives to intercede. Verse 25, 725. We know that we can trust and we can be completely saved because he appears and still to this day intercedes in the presence of God on behalf of those who trust in him. Jesus saves and saves us completely and lives to intercede on behalf of us in the presence of God. So before the throne of God, as a, a great hymn says, we have that, we have a strong and perfect plea. We have a great high priest whose name is Jesus, whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for us. And to know that right now today for all who have believed in him, he's interceding for us. He's powerfully praying for us. And that should encourage us, especially as we face difficulty and challenges of this world. Let me give you a better traction. In Luke chapter 22, uh, Jesus has this dialogue with, with Peter. And I want to just kind of narrow it down. And he says to, he says to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like we. Notice what Jesus says. He says, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. This verse in Luke gives you an idea of how powerfully Jesus prays. The powerful effect of Jesus' prayer the context was the, the Lord's Supper. And what is happening? They had just taken communion with Jesus. And the, you would think it's a holy moment, and it was. But guess what happened Like almost like minutes afterwards? There was conflict. There was conflict after this communion time with Jesus. What did the disciples do? Or what was their conversation? The conversation was topic was, who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? And so they're going at it with, with each other. And they're arguing who is the greatest. And of course, Jesus settles it with the perspective. And he directs that comment to Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like we. Think about it. This is not the first time that Jesus had mentioned Satan to the disciples, particularly to Peter. And we should all be aware that the enemy is at work. 
Even 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We know that the enemy is causing chaos and conflict. And he wants the people of God to doubt God, to mistrust God, to forget about God. He wants to shake them up in their faith, discourage people from serving God or even proclaiming his gospel truth. Now we should know, especially when we think back of another Old Testament book, and that is in the book of Job, Satan cannot mess with any of God's children with, unless given permission. And so Jesus is not letting us know what is happening in the, what is happening. Well, Jesus is letting us know what is happening in the unseen, the spiritual realm. The Savior is stopping Satan in his track. Because he's saying, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. God has spoken. It is the same power. It is the same power that, that Jesus calmed the sea, cast out the demonic, healed the sick. Satan's trying to mess up the faith, but Jesus is countering it. He's saying, I prayed for you, Peter, and I pray that your faith will not fail. Peter's going to make it. He's going to make it not because he's better, not because he has more determination, not because he's more willing. Peter's going to make it because Jesus says so. And not just Jesus said so, because Jesus prayed so. Peter is not going to fail. Stumble, yes. Fail, no. And this gets better. In one brief phrase, Jesus says, and when you turn, and when you turn again, strengthen the brothers. So in other words, Peter, don't just look for yourself. You're going to get back on your feet. But I want you to encourage. I want you to strengthen the brothers. And of course, this side, we know what happened. We know that Peter denied Christ, but by the grace of God, he turned back in sorrow and repentance, and Jesus restored him. And do you know what else happened? Peter did do as Jesus had prayed. He strengthened the brothers. He fed the sheep. Why am I mentioning this? Because today Jesus prays for us. It is the same power. You are not going to just survive. You are not just going to barely make it, but you will thrive. God saves us. He sanctifies us. He set us apart to do some good works. We are his workmanship, as Ephesians tells us. And there's good works that we will step into because of the Lord. The power of Jesus' prayer, as long as you, you have today, understand and be confident that Jesus is praying for you. In your weakness, in your desperation, in your sorrows, in your confusion, Jesus is praying for you. And the same type of pray, same way that he prays with compassion, prays in tears, is the same way he's praying for you right now, interceding on your behalf before the throne of the Lord. I don't know about you, but that encourages me. That engages me even more so to trust in Jesus. And like the hymn we said, tis so sweet to trust in him. That he's got my back. 
He hasn't just forgiven my sins, but he has my back even today. And he wants me to continue on. There is a part where we should be invigorated and empowered by, by what Jesus has done. Empowered by the spirit that he has given us to help us to live the Christian life. To live above circumstances. To live above conflict and chaos. We should be encouraged what Jesus is, do, is doing today. We should be encouraged and not just live in boldly the Christian life, but also be encouraged that we could confess. We could be genuine. We could be real about our struggles, our struggles of, of sin, our struggles of things that are holding us back and living a fruitful an audible life. We can be real with Jesus because he is praying for us. And as we pray, as we let him know, we can let him know everything. And know that he has compassion upon us and will encourage us and work within us. He is committed. Jesus yesterday, Jesus today. Do you remember the third point? Jesus forever. Earlier in Hebrews chapter one, verse eight, it says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of the kingdom. Here the author quotes Psalm 45, Verses six and seven, it's a reference running through verse nine. And in that Old Testament passage, it heralds or proclaims, let us know that the ultimate victory is in the Messiah. 45, Psalm 45 is the most is most directed about an earthly king's wedding, but the symbolism and the meaning are echoes of the relationship between King of Jesus, who is the King and the Messiah, and his spiritual bride, the church. So here it is, forever to be fulfilled. The term or the nature of Jesus as king, his throne will be forever and ever. The reference to the scepter, it's a clear symbol of power and authority, dominating no interruptions, no timeouts, no end. I don't know about you, but in our household, we were watching the Queen Elizabeth, um, the, the funeral, and they had that scepter, right? And they, they broke the stick to, to signal the, the end. Well, Jesus' scepter is not going to be broken. He has the scepter. It's a clear symbol of power and authority. There is no interruptions. There is no end to his rule. There's no wait a second. There's no flag on the play. There's no recall. There's no coaches' challenges. No. There's nothing. Jesus will reign forever and ever. When we think about evangelism, sometimes we think it's a scary thought. But the way I look at evangelism is really, it should be this. It's preparing others for the Lord's reign. We are in some sense preparing people for the Lord's reign. It's coming. When we will fully see the full extent of his reign. We know that every knee shall bow. As scripture tells us in Philippians. And every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. We are in some sense preparing people for the Lord's reign. And according to the verse that every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, I encourage people to do it now. To confess Jesus now, then later. When we're preaching the gospel, when we're sharing the truth about Jesus, we are simply preparing others for the Lord's reign for, for eternity. 
we're preparing others for the Lord's reign for all eternity. Secondly, looking forward, the, the forever reign, the forever rule, the forever righteousness of, of Christ. That's what it's like to be in his presence. His rule, his reign, his righteousness. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Why is this significant? Jesus yesterday. This is significance that Jesus be the same yesterday as he is today because yesterday is when Jesus Christ showed us through his incarnation as written in scripture what he's really like. And we could know him through the truth in scripture. Jesus today. It's important to note that Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday because today is where we have fellowship with him. We can relate to him. We could experience the, the sweetness and trusting in Jesus today, moment by moment. We can relate to him as a person. We can know more about his life and his work through scripture. Jesus forever. This is just as significant as the first two because Jesus is going to be the same as he is yesterday and today and forever. Because all our hope for everlasting joy is based upon who he is, what he has done, and what he'll do for all eternity. If you still have your Bibles open, you notice in, um, in verse 7, verse 9, I just want to highlight it, because remember, the, if you think about this clear, concise statement in verse 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You could go back, backtrack the verses, and then you could go forward, if you backtrack the best, it says, remember the, your leaders, those who've spoken to you the word of God. It says, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And then, of course, it says, Jesus is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. If you're going to follow a leader, you need to see Jesus in them. If you want to be a leader, you must follow Jesus. People need to see Jesus in you. And that's what you want to imitate in them. What you need to imitate in them was whatever is evident of Jesus in their lives, who is the same yesterday and today and tomorrow. What you want to imitate is Christ-like behavior. What you want to imitate is Jesus. Verse 9. Verse 9 tells us, Do not be led away by diverse and strange teaching, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have been not benefited for those devoted to them. Just get that first phrase there, that first sentence. Don't be led away by diverse and strange teachings. There's a lot of teaching going on, and we're not talking just in the classroom. There's a lot of teachings going on, and we're not just talking about on the radio. Talk about the podcast. We're talking about elsewhere. And every year, sometimes it gets weirder and weirder what's coming out. Especially those who do not know Jesus, who's the same yesterday and today and forever. Any good minister will, should be telling you more about Jesus. Point to Christ as he preaches God's word. We need to center, especially on Christ. This is one of the most important doctrines. You hear people telling 
uh, less of Christ. That is less of Christ as according to scripture. You need to dismiss it. You need to see, you need to be consistent what is being said in God's word about Jesus. And it's a warning here. Jesus is the same. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is consistent. He came to save. He will save. We should be in solid in our doctrine, solid in our practice. We shouldn't be carried away from strange teachings. One of the most subtle approaches by the enemy to the Christians to move them away from sound doctrine, to get them wrapped up in, in beliefs that are unfounded, uncertain, and changing. Bad doctrine results in bad living. Good doctrine results in good living. One of the most important doctrines we have, one of the most important set of beliefs that we have is Christ. Live there, stay there. What does 1 Corinthians tells us in chapter 15? This is of first importance. And that has to do with the death and the resurrection of Christ. Jesus said, gave that practice for us to follow. And that is why we are also gathered here to remember his death. Because he said, do this in remembrance of me. His atoning death, his bodily sacrifice. Of course, we know without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness. Jesus wants you to remember what he did yesterday. He wants you to remember him today. He wants you to also anticipate his reign forever. Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God Almighty, Father, we we are so grateful. We are so grateful that that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, in his incarnation to us. We thank you that throughout his life, he provided the ultimate demonstration, example of humility, gentleness, patience, love. We know and we read and we understand when he suffered, there was no deceit. There was no ill will. There was no disparaging word that came forth. We are grateful that he bore our sins, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And so, Father, we do pray that you would give us humility. You would relieve us from any semblance of stubborn pride, that you would give us gentleness, that you would remove all harshness or even rigidness in our lives, that you give us patience, that you reduce all resistance and insistence in our lives, that we may be patient, that we may live a life that's honoring to Christ. Father, we pray, Lord, that we would stay on the doctrine of Christ. We pray for this church that it will continue to uphold the preaching of Christ crucified. And Father, may Christ continue to be exalted in our lives. And may we all be humble. We're so thankful that we could trust the Savior who is the same yesterday and today and forever. We pray all these things in Christ's name.
Amen.